Australia has long been a refuge for Irish people. And in recent years, tens of thousands have left our shores for a new life down under. Two Irish backpackers are in a critical condition after a hammer attack. First, we go to Australia, where a man originally from Dublin was stabbed to death. And we're hopeful for the best, but we have some concerns that she may have met with foul play. For some, the dream has become the nightmare. He's ruined a lot of lives in Ireland. I'll never forgive him what he's done. Since 2012, there have been a number of high-profile murders of Irish people living in Australia. A 30-year-old Irish backpacker has died. These murders shocked Australia and caused a national outrage. I can't stop thinking about it. <laughs> this film features three cases of Irish people murdered in Victoria. When you wake up in the mornings, it's kind of like, was that a bad dream? And then you say, no, it's not a dream, it's reality. Going out with friends for a drink on a Friday night and then to be literally plucked at random. And I remember seeing Dad's body on the ground. These cases expose a dark side to life down under and are connected by a number of unsettling similarities. If three people from Melbourne were murdered in Dublin, people here would be saying, what's going on in Dublin? I was having great difficulty remembering what he looked like. And um, I have these horrible images and all I can see is him lying on the floor in a pool of blood and gone. And I would get quite hysterical. And my psychologist said to me to try and remember what he looked like. She said, do a collage of pictures and put them on your fridge because you open your fridge all the time. So I come to the fridge all the time, not to eat, but just, just to remember. And yeah, you'd be pleased to know he looks like Richard Gere. <laughs> My sister once described it. She said, Bridget was the quiet one and Dermot was the explosion. <laughs> Dermot and I were always great friends, known him since I was six years old and became dance partners at the Irish Dancing in Dublin. People used to say to us, there's sparks fly between you two, you need to get together, you know. We were totally inseparable. So we were married in 1972. We started talking about an adventure to Australia. I told my mother first and um, she was, she didn't say very much, she was just absolutely stunned. I have a wonderful picture of us all at Dublin Airport. Every single one of them were there, the whole clan. <laughs> it was a huge step. You know, you're not knowing anybody, you know. I remember thinking, what are we doing, you know? But at the same token, we just fell in love with it. Right? It was just such a wonderful city. We were both so keen to be parents. In 1975, Christian was born, and then the twins were born. They were just so cute and adorable, what we thought they were in any way. Having Irish parents it was always a bit of a laugh when we brought friends around for the same time and our parents had Irish accents. Families that have been here for, for a while, they've never heard words like Egypt before. All our memories with our grandparents were you know, phone calls with like two or three second delays. And for us as young kids, that accent barrier always, was always a bit of a challenge. You know, we were doing yes, mm-hmm, yep. It was surreal for them. They couldn't understand that mum has this big family of brothers and sisters over there. And so we flew into Dublin and I said to them, do you see that group over there? And I said, yes, I said, that's them. There's absolutely thousands of you. <laughs> Bridget and Dermot and the boys, they were a really tight family unit. When you've got a family that's come from the other side of the world and, you know, there aren't too many of you over here, you know, you really do lean on each other. 
You become very conscious of making a really close family bond with your own children. You know, we were going to create this happy, loving home. It didn't matter what would happen. Nobody was going to upset us or our children, you know. In 1981, the O'Toole's moved to Hastings, a small town on the outskirts of Melbourne. And it was here that Dermot opened his new business. Dermot decided to open up his shop, the jewel shed. Small store, hardly any jewellery in it, but it didn't take long for them to, you know, really build up that clientele and, um, and that relationship with their customers. One of the reasons why the shop was there for 20 odd years was their Irishness. There was a novelty factor. People would come into mum and dad's shop and not necessarily even want to buy things. They'd just come in and have a chat with mum and dad because they knew that with dad that they'd get a good laugh. People coming into the shop, he would make them laugh, you know. You know? And I think that was the, his gift. He had so much charisma. Uh, you know, he'd walk into a room and within 10 minutes, the whole room would be in uproar. Dad would just take over because he yeah. just did. We were exceptionally happy and people coming into the shop would remark it to us, you know. Sometimes we never shut up, you know. I don't know how we found the things to talk about. We were always chatting. Here was this couple. They worked together, they danced together. They were joined at the hip. They did everything together. Never seen a couple like Bridget and Dermot, ever. They were the perfect couple, you know. I've never seen a couple like them. A robbery gone tragically wrong. A hooded man forced his way inside their family business of 30 years a young man did an armed robbery on a jewellery store armed with a knife. And we're going to Australia where we've had news in the last hour or so that a man who was high on drugs murdered a jeweller near the city of Melbourne. News first we go to Australia where a 64-year-old Irishman has been murdered in his jewellery shop in Hastings, Victoria, and listeners are advised that there are some graphic details in what follows. He came in with his girlfriend because he wanted some jewellery. I remembered that was instinctively known, oh my God, he's huge, you know. And he's looking at all the gold and diamond jewellery that's in my counter. But then Dermot has stepped up uh, from the workshop and he's come out and he stood at the side. He was, was very protective of me, and if anything would go on, he would always like to make people aware she's not in this shop on her own, I'm here. And he puts his hand up his top. And he's proceeded to wipe, lean over and wipe all his fingerprints off the counter. And he said, oh, I've left all my fingerprints and start rubbing them off. But then I do recall him walking down other section of the shop and obviously he was taking everything in. And then he's wiped any fingerprints that may be left on the door. And he came back at five o'clock. I heard the buzzer going in the shop. And I said to Dermot, I'll get this. And then 
I saw something come at me. And so I pushed my hands up to to actually stop whatever it was coming after me, at me, which was a knife. He was just screaming. A merciful screaming like a wild animal. He's grabbed me and he has stabbed me several times and he's literally trying to gut me. He's literally, and I'm just jumping back and concaving my body and um, he just keeps trying to plunge this knife at me. He was continuously stabbing me and Dermot's come running out to try and get him off me, so he fired me. I went flying through the air about six, eight foot into this plate glass cabinet and I can still hear that noise. She exploded like a bomb. I've fallen over and I see him attacking Dermot. Dermot's defenseless on the ground and he has stood over Dermot. He's moved around Dermot um, and he's plunged a knife into him. And then he takes off. When Dermot got up off the floor and he stood in front of me, and he just, he was ashen and he just said to me, call an ambulance, I've been stabbed. The phone's ringing and ringing. And Christian came in from outside. and He answered the phone. He was literally standing next to the dinner table with all three of our kids around him. And Bridget's voice just, reverberated. She was, Mum was screaming down the phone. By this point, just screaming, which I regret to this day because his children were with the near shot. <laughs> and they, sh I had just lost it. And I couldn't understand her at first. And I said, Mum, I'm sorry, you'll have to just stop, try it again. And what I heard was, your father's been stabbed. I don't think he's going to make it. I think he's dead. I was on the train home from work. I've never heard so much terror in her voice. She was in hysterics. And she just screamed down the phone to me. Um, she goes, Trent, she goes, there's been a hold up. Your dad's been stabbed and he's unconscious. I don't think he's going to make it. Trent gave me a call um, to give me the news that you know, Dad had been stabbed. And at that point, you know, and that there was an arm robbery, and we didn't know how Dad was at that point in time. In my mind, Dad was going to be OK. He'll be fine. They are doing CPR on him. There was just so much blood. I was screaming because I was just hysterical. I was just rocking back and forth. And I remember just pray, praying that he just can't die. I remember trying to bargain with God to spare him. And the more they worked on, there was just volumes of blood coming out of him. And eventually I just said, I know he's dead. You can stop working on him. Dermot had gone. I wanted to go to Dermot and they wouldn't let me. I remember begging them, and they eventually said, let her go to him. All I cared at that point in time that I should be dead with him, because the pain of losing him like that, what we had endured, and seeing him die like that in front of me, it was just unbearable. I quite willingly would have just died with him. Mum gave me the news, and, um, I was just hysterical as well, and I didn't have to say anything to her. She just gave me a big hug. Dale gave me a call when I was still driving um, not too far from the train station, and I answered the phone and he says, um, Trent, he goes, are you driving? I said, yes. And he goes, I need you to pull over, and it was at that time. I ran through the barricade, the police had cordoned off. 
and I remember seeing Dad's body on the ground. They had covered it up by that point, but I'd seen the carnage in the shop, and the police, of course, wouldn't let me in because it was a crime scene. I had strangers in the street confirming for me that, that Dad had died. I mean, there was no opportunity to process anything. And I remember Mum being just white and this shell. I've never seen Mum like that before. She had blood on her clothes. She was shaking in her hysterics. It's just hysterical, hyperventilating. Um, like, I've seen people hyperventilate, but not like this. I remember Dale leaning over and he's screaming at me and he says, please, Mum, breathe, please, Mum, breathe, you know? Seeing, seeing your mum like that, knowing that you, your dad's just been murdered, is probably something I'll never forget. And all my concerns, have they got him yet? Have they got him yet? And they hadn't. First, we go to Australia. Dermot O'Toole, who was originally from Dublin, was stabbed to death in his jewellery shop in Hastings, Victoria, in southeastern Australia. In 2013, Dermot O'Toole was murdered in Australia. He was the third Irish national to be murdered in the Melbourne area within one year. I did follow Dermot and Bridget's circumstances, and I thought, here we go, here we go again. He's another Irishman has been killed by someone in Melbourne. The reality is Victoria is an incredibly safe place to live and to travel in. Statistically, less than one murder every 100,000 people makes it a very safe place. But it has some bad people. Less than a year before Dermot's murder, a 30-year-old Irishman was attacked while working in Melbourne. David Green grew up in Cabinteely in South Dublin. Originally, there was a tree here, and myself and Davy cut it down. So I built this shed, and I was going to have it as an office. I went away for a weekend, and when I came back, there, Davy had moved his bed in. He had a television, a radiator, and this was his little pad now. No, I feel the closeness to him in here. The whole thing, it is like a dream. And even when you wake up in the mornings, it's kind of like, was that a bad dream? And then a minute later, you say, no, it's not a dream, it's reality. He's just a happy little boy. He was just the clown of the house, you know, just always making faces. Every photograph. He was a character, Davy. He really was. Growing up in Cabin Teeley, everyone knew Davy. You know, he was the he's the first person you saw when you drove into the estate. He just charm anybody, no matter who we'd meet. They'd all come back and say to me, "Oh my God, your son is so funny." Women, just all the women just flocked around him. We just had this charm. It was just unbelievable. That shared the love shack. That's how everyone kind of said, wasn't it? Do you know that way? But yeah, like he was a, a ladies' man. All right. Yeah, so you charmed the rapper off of Snickers. We walked together at the Brick Lane and walked us straight up, really, basically. That's why he went to Australia. It was me who actually encouraged him to go. So we got him a one way ticket, because we knew if we got him a return ticket, he'd be home after a month or two. We kept in contact, the usual texting, sending pictures you know, of the beach, you know, seven o'clock in the morning, well, it's raining here, you know. It's brilliant here, the weather, the pay, you know, the land of opportunities, really, you know. While in Melbourne, David got a job managing a hostel, renting out rooms to backpackers, many of whom were Irish. I went to Melbourne and it was very tough. I couldn't find any work and I was running out of money. And my friend told me David Green was living in Melbourne. So I actually went up to his house and there he was with a big smile on his face. And 
wearing sunglasses and looked like he'd really settled in well to life in Melbourne. Now I wasn't at that place yet, so I went in to meet him and he straight away cooked me a meal and made me feel very comfortable. If you want a job, I'll get you a job. You know, stay on the couch, stay on the couch. And this is Davy when he was in Melbourne in deep thought. Yeah, Davy was a free spirit. He didn't worry about tomorrow or he didn't worry about people. He just, he just lived for today. He just rang me one day and he said uh, a guy had moved into the house and he was a bit strange. That's all he said about him. He didn't say he was bad. He just said he was a bit weird. Very big, but um, you could tell there was something, you know, he was sheepish. You know, head down, just, how you going, mate? How you going, mate? You know? I didn't think too much of him. The last words I said to Davy was keep away from him. And that was the last words I actually spoke to Davy. Two Irish backpackers are in a critical condition after a suspected hammer attack in St Kilda overnight. The pair sustained serious head injuries in the assault at a boarding house just after one o'clock this morning. There'd been a party on this evening with a number of backpackers, but as Luke went halt it was about to go to bed, something seemed to have snapped in him. He accused David Green of making a move on his girlfriend and he then assaulted him. When another Irish backpacker, David Bias, tried to intervene, he attacked him as well, so both men were lying unconscious in the hallway. In Australia, for just six months, David Green was bashed unconscious, repeatedly stomped on the head. It was just an ordinary Saturday and just doing things around the house. And then we got a phone call from the police in Melbourne to say there had been an altercation and that we needed to go to Australia straight away. And at, at that time, I didn't realise that bad. I thought maybe it was just an argument or something like that. So Aidan booked the flight straight away. The families of two men still critically ill following an assault with a hammer have travelled to Melbourne. How are the two men now? Have their families come to see them? We believe that their families arrived. Um, the older of the two men is in a stable condition and the younger man is in a critical condition at the moment. I remember the flight was so long and I just thought I'd go over and I'd see Davy and he'd just be sick in hospitals and he'd be just Davy again. But when I went in and seen all the tubes and the way he looked and all, I realised he was sicker than I thought in my mind. We just had to be hopeful that things might work out. I remember praying all the time, just get me through this, just help me get through this. So all his friends were around the bed talking to him, playing Christy Moore music, which he loved. Just horrific. Every Irish family's worst nightmare, you know, and, and everyone was thinking positive and hoping that he'd pull through, you know, and praying and hoping and praying all the time. He kept jerking his arm and I kept going out to the nurse and saying, he's waking up, he's waking up, and they just said it's involuntary spasms, you know, so we we're kind of living in hope that was him waking up and he even yawned at one stage. The longer it went on, you'd still believe, like, in the back of your head, he'd be all right, you know, he'd be all right, Davey, he's, he's a fighter, you know. I still had hope. We never gave up hope, but after a week, 10 days, the hope was starting to fall, you know? The doctor called Aidan and Catherine into the room first. They said there was no brain activity, so they talked about turning off the machine. They said when they turn off the machine, they're going to see, can he make it on his own? Good morning, 
learned at 13 minutes past eight since we came on the air. We've heard from Australia that an Irishman who was injured in a hammer attack at a boarding house in Melbourne has died in hospital. David Green, a 30-year-old Irish backpacker, the victim of a St Kilda East attack, has died. David Bias has made a full recovery, but David Green was so badly injured that his family who came out from Ireland was forced to turn off his life support. Can't describe the pain. No one knows, unless they go through it themselves, what the pain is like of losing a child that way. Three days after David's death, Luke Wentholt was charged with his murder. A pilgrimage to the country which held such promise for their son, instead arriving here to front his killer. At the Melbourne Magistrates' Court, the Green family faced their son's killer for the first time. Luke Wentholt pleaded not guilty. Luke Wentholt was a cold person. Went Holt was trying to turn it around and say that he was assaulted first by David and he was not the instigator of this. That painted the picture of who Luke was. He, he, he didn't care for um, anybody else but himself in those circumstances. I just felt sick passing by him. I just felt so sick, but I couldn't look at him. Wentold looked down, stony face, throughout today's hearing. His lawyer pointed out his disadvantaged background. So the judge said that he had a violent adult life. He did have a long, violent history since he turned 18. He's been in trouble with the law. He's had all sorts of convictions for assault and criminal damage. It soon became apparent that Luke Wentold had a long and violent criminal history. There is a report that he assaulted a sex worker. He beat her badly and robbed her. There are unconfirmed reports that the individual charge does have a criminal record and was on parole at the time. He just seemed to be going from state to state, committing crimes. I'll never forgive him what he's done. He's taken away my beautiful son. I'll never forgive him. And I just hope he gets what he deserves. The anger that he was only out of jail three months and he just landed on Davy's doorstep. The Green family flew their son's body home to Ireland and David Green was buried in Dublin on the 17th of September, 2012. I just don't know where she is. I'd love to just know where she is or what happened. Or... Just, uh, she's, this isn't something she doesn't do, so, um, yeah. It's been more than 40 hours now and Thomas Maas still hasn't seen or heard from his wife. 29-year-old Jill, an Irish national, was out drinking with friends on a typical Friday night on Sydney Road, Brunswick. The Jill Maher murder was one of the most high-profile murders in Australia in living memory. And we're hopeful for the best, obviously but we have some concerns that she may have met with foul play. The discovery this morning of her handbag has everyone, including police, extremely concerned. It was huge. The impact on the community from Jill Maher's death was huge. News of what happened to Jill Maher began to filter around Brunswick. Those she'd never even met lay flowers and wept openly. I can't stop thinking about it. I don't know, it's just impacted on me. Every young woman in Melbourne can relate to that. Going out with friends for a drink on a Friday night and making the decision to, to, to walk home, the short distance home, and then to be literally plucked at random. These are the final chilling images of Gillian Ma talking to a mysterious man before she follows him with a few hesitant steps. With a final glance over her shoulder, she's gone, walking out of picture, never to be seen again. It was a massive thing in Victoria because a man with something in the order of 20 prior convictions for rape um, was out uh, on parole. After a week of agony, Tom Marr came to see the man who allegedly raped and murdered his wife of three years. 30,000 people marched through the street. In their expression of outrage at a system that had allowed someone with those sorts of prior convictions to be out on the street.
Jill's murder put the Australian parole system under scrutiny, and in the following months, public anger escalated. Despite this, less than five months after Jill's murder, the Parole Board of Victoria released a convicted armed robber on parole. Gavin Perry is a good example of the justification for the concern of a large proportion of the community of, uh, of this state. Gavin Perry was a violent man, had grown up in a violent community, a lot of it being prison, and had been in and out of prison since his youth. But a very, very strong, a low IQ. Indeed, it showed that he had a predilection for violence that was just playing out in an increasing fashion. There's a man who, at the age of 27, uh, has managed to accumulate 200 criminal convictions. Is released from prison after having been convicted of six armed robberies after four years of imprisonment and released on parole. And the tragic outcome of that release is now known by none more so than Bridget O'Toole and her family. A man who was obviously violent and obviously going to commit another crime was released back into the community. I remember the police putting all these needles into me and, and cleaning out stab wounds and I mean, the policewoman holding my hand and apologising to me. <laughs> she was so deeply upset. And I remember the police apologising to me. They kept asking me all these questions and they question you and question you and they explain to you that, you know, they have to ask you this while it's still fresh in your memory. I always figure that the first day I meet these people is the absolute worst day of their lives. There couldn't be a worse day in their life, so... With our investigation, we had a suspect fairly quickly in mind, but Bridget's initial recollection of what had happened was, was not great. It, it, it was good, but it lacked specific detail. I remember Lee from Homicide coming down and showing me all these books, and I couldn't pick them out of the book. Yeah, it's not often that we catch a murder on video. I've never shown Bridget the CCTV of the incident itself because it's so quick and so violent. The only CCTV I've ever shown her was I showed her some images of Perry going in earlier. And the moment I showed her those images, that, that's when things came back to her and she realised that that was the same person who'd come in and committed the murder. The vehicle that he used in this crime was his girlfriend's car. Initially, when she spoke to us, she gave us a false account that the car had been stolen from her, but within probably 10, 15 minutes of speaking with her and letting her know the gravity of what had actually happened, um, she started to tell us the true story and, and that Gavin was involved uh, in the armed robbery and that he'd taken her car and that the car had been burnt. We got two droplets of blood that were found by our crime scene, amazingly, in the dark in a huge car park. Perry tripped over in the car park. He cut his forehead. And we also got Dermot's blood, which had come off the knife. Um, so all of those sort of things made it pretty much an insurmountable case for him to, to be able to defend. The first thing the boys said to me, Mum, they've got him, they've arrested him. And whilst I was so pleased that they got him and they arrested him, that this couldn't happen to somebody else, um, it was like... Well, it's not going to do me any good. All you keep thinking is it's not going to bring Dermot back. Between August 2012 and July 2013, three Irish nationals were murdered in the Melbourne area. David Green, Jill Marr, and Dermot O'Toole.
Public sympathy across Australia was unprecedented. A robbery gone tragically wrong. Dermot O'Toole murdered. He was stabbed to death. Sound like glass was just smashing. We heard the breaking glass and then the scream. Butcher Mark Wallace chased them. We were trying to establish the facts first, trying to establish the sequence of events and trying to establish who had done this um, and more about him. But then people were coming to the shop and stopping and getting emotional. And I think that was the point when all us journos stood back and sort of went, oh, wow, like, this is, this is big. Nothing could have prepared me for how loved Dermot was. Beautiful pets. Yeah. Lovely, lovely couple. Yeah. Uh, we'll go out of your way to do anything for you. I just want Bridget to know that we're all thinking about her and her family. We'd completed our papers that Friday night and then when we realised the enormity of the situation, we went and spent the weekend redesigning the papers. News began to spread throughout the area that Dermot's killer was yet another convicted criminal with a lengthy record. Well, Gavin Perry spent most of his life in and out of jail, so he'd managed to rack up more than 200 criminal convictions. In fact, when he committed this murder, he was on parole. It became clear that he was on parole, and that was something that I think infuriated people. This man should have still been in jail. Gavin Perry was committed to six years in prison for six armed robberies and two thefts, and they let him out after four years, and five months later, he killed Dad. Three brave brothers making an emotional pilgrimage to the jewellery shop where he was murdered. We know you grieve with us. We know you have us in your hearts, and we want you to know that you are firmly in ours. The parole system was already in the limelight, and the parole board had seen instances before Gavin Perry where the system should have been changed, and it wasn't. This was yet another case where this man should not have been granted parole, and somehow was. And this is the ultimate consequence. It's an arcane process. It just doesn't seem to make sense. And it's a concern for the future because it's not the first time that the system has failed us and undoubtedly it won't be the last. Adrian Bailey was found guilty of Jill Maher's murder. You, by 2012, were an experienced hunter. Once each of these victims were in your sights, their fate was sealed. I fix a new non-parole period of 43 years to commence today. I am also conscious that the sentence that I have imposed will most likely ensure you have likely forfeited your right to hope or expectation of eventual release from prison. I've been really humbled by the support uh, of the Australian public, the um, tireless efforts of the police um, and all the friends and family who've uh, put their lives on hold to, to, to help us out. It's the worst thing we'll ever go through in our lives. In September 2013, Luke Wentholt was sentenced for the murder of David Green. Never in my wildest nightmare did I ever think someone could do this to my beautiful Davy. He promised he would surprise me when he was coming home. My life will never be the same again. I can't even walk outside my front door. I run back inside with fear. The fear of even going to sleep scares me. I pray that Davy understands I couldn't save him as a mother. Love you forever, Davy. Please stay with me. Ma'am, Catherine, don't ever leave me. You have led a violent adult life with little regard to the safety and well-being of others. One witness described you as behaving like a crazy monster, kicking or stomping on the heads of the two unconscious men. I regard the needs to deter you and to protect others from you as relevant factors in this sentencing exercise. We're going to Melbourne, Australia now, where Luke Wentold has been jailed this morning for 18 and a half years, 15 of them without possibility of parole. I think justice was done that he got 18 years, but it just, it didn't matter. Davey wasn't coming back.
In October of 2014, the O'Toole's met their father's killer in court. The first time I saw Gavin Perry in person, all I remember is just my body just shaking with adrenaline. I do remember locking eyes with him. And, you know, I wasn't saying anything, I wasn't mouthing anything to him. All he did was look straight back into my eyes as well. Absolutely no emotion. It was like looking into a blank canvas. I remember his size when he, when he came into the court and just my first thought when I saw him was, Mum and Dad had, didn't have a chance. And he just stared me down. He had this look on his face like, you're the reason I'm here. Gavin Perry was charged with armed robbery, the murder of Dermot, and intentionally causing injury to Bridget. He initially denied involvement. I was hoping he would get at least 30 to 35 years, but in my heart, I was hoping for life. The stabbing attack of mum really was more fitting to go under an attempted murder as opposed to um, an assault charge. Like he stabbed me several times, beat me up, fired me across into a cabinet. He was trying to kill me as well. So I wanted him to be put away for as long as possible. He was initially charged with intentionally causing serious injury against Bridget, but the injuries didn't fall into the category under legislation of Victoria as being serious, so it only come as an injury. The prosecution, the lawyers, called us in and we had a meeting. They said to me he would agree to plead guilty if the word serious was taken out of my attack. Um, and we thought, OK, he'll, it'll still be a good sentence. With, with this sentence, um, I really set myself in my, my own mind to expect the worst. Um, and when the sentence came down, part of me, I was, just, I was just puzzled. It was like a knife was being twisted through me. I could not believe it. First, we go to Australia, where a man who murdered a 64-year-old Irishman has been sentenced to 27 years in jail and will serve at least 23 years of that term. If as far as sentences here go, this is what many people here would consider to be quite lenient. But the reason um, that it was, was that he pleaded guilty. So you get a discount for a sentence here because you spare the victims and their families the ordeal of going through a trial. He received five years imprisonment for the armed robbery. He received 20 years imprisonment for the murder. And then he received the minimum of two years for the injury on Bridget. Captain Perry got only, you know, 20 years for the murder of my dad. And I, I couldn't make any sense of it. And I remember coming out and I was absolutely devastated. I was just like 20 years from what he had done, you know? I, I was appalled. I could not believe then that he only has to serve two years for what he did to me. I know that Gavin Perry killed Dad with intent. And that in that same regard, he was actually trying to murder Mum as well. Bridget continues to campaign for tighter control on parole and tougher sentencing. Today, she's meeting the Victims of Crime Commissioner, Greg Davis, in Melbourne. Gavin Perry will only be 51 years mm. of age when he's released. He'll be five years younger than me. Exactly. There is no group in our community who we allow to put a value on human life other than judges. And I don't think they value it highly enough. And that being the case, I think it's time the system was changed. Well, that's why I'm fighting. I'm mm. fighting for justice for Dermot, but not only that, that just does not happen to another family. I just have to be the voice for Dermot. In Dublin, the Green family continue to hold an annual golf tournament in memory of their son, David, and to raise funds for victims of homicide. The idea of it is that we still remember Davy, 
for the person who he was. I think there's a certain amount of healing in it, knowing yeah. that something good is going to come out of this. And the uh, third prize is Matthew Verhoeven. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just like to say thanks very much to everybody for coming and keep David's memory alive. Because I know he's up there looking down on us. And thanks very much. <laughs> It's very hard, but you have to keep going. In the beginning, I thought of him lying on the floor there and I, as a mother, not being there for him. But now I think, when I'm down, I think of um, what Davy would say. Now, if he knew I was upset and things like that, I'd just say, don't worry, Catherine. Everything will be all right. Yeah. Dermot O'Toole has returned to Hastings for the first time since her husband was stabbed trying to protect her. It's an absolute privilege to live in this community and thank you for everything. The community held a green day for Dermot, the council naming a bench seat in his honour in the town centre. Dad used to show his customers a lot of cheek, and I think it's good that there's a chair for people's chair now here with Dad's name in it that you can all sit on and show him a bit of Hastings cheek yourself. <laughs> Dermot's death has also prompted the local council to install CCTV cameras in the main street of Hastings, but they're also planning to improve lighting in laneways, including O'Toole Walk. When I think about Gavin Perry, I can't help but sort of think about him out of prison in 24 years' time. Gavin Perry works well under authority, so when he's in prison, everyone thinks, oh, this guy is OK, he's a good character. Um, and it's not until he's out of prison and doesn't have that authority in that regimen that he really just lets loose and he has no control. Do I live in fear if he ever gets out? I fear for Mum, really, because Mum could be in her 80s when he's released and I don't know how she'd be psychologically if he was released while she was still alive. I also fear for my nephews and nieces. They'll be in their 30s when Gavin Perry's released based on his current sentence. I remember the day Gavin Perry had come into the shop. The shop had actually been very quiet that day. Dermot had this longing. About three o'clock in the afternoon, he said, I'm dying for a bit of chocolate. He was diabetic and he said, I'm due for my blood test next week. And as only Dermot could, he came back with a large family block of fruit and nut. Ten minutes later, it was gone. And just this impish look, he just looked at me and he said, mm, I think I might leave my blood test for about a month. <laughs> I'll cancel next week's, you know. I'm so pleased he had that last family block of chocolate. <laughs>